My primary use of the heuristic test strategy model is as a structure that supports active reading. James developed the model to support risk-based testing, and as I said in the last lecture, it's very useful for that. But as a tool for organizing information about software products, it's remarkable. Imagine reading a spec. A few statements in a spec are meaningless fluff, but most tell you something about the product. Sometimes you get information about product elements, that's what's in the product. And sometimes you get information about project factors, that's the context of the product. And sometimes you get information about the quality related goals for this product. I can sort every piece of information into one of the categories or subcategories of the heuristic test strategy model. And as I work through the documents, I can keep sorting information into this structure. I might find information about the same feature in five or ten different documents. If I'm still confused after this, I can walk over to one of the programmers and ask questions. If they say, go read the spec, I can say, actually I did read the spec. And here's my map of the spec. And here's what I learned from the spec. And here are the questions that I have that the spec doesn't answer. People get it when I do this. They understand that I'm not wasting their time with questions that I can easily find the answer to myself. And so they give me the time I need. I use concept mapping tools to capture the information. There are several good tools. In this course, we're going to use XMind. You can download a free copy from xmind.net. Please use XMind for the assignment because it's too hard on your instructors if different students submit concept maps in different formats. For longer term use, though, I'd recommend any of the four tools on this list, and some people find some others worth considering. Here's a picture of an XMind map. The central topic is the heuristic test strategy model. Off of that come four branches, product elements, project environment, quality criteria, and test techniques. The reason test techniques is a branch in this model is that Bach uses the other three branches to help him decide what technique to use. I leave this branch off when I use this model. The next several slides just repeat what you can see in the heuristic test strategy model itself. This slide shows the project environment, such as the project's scheduling, customers, and testing capabilities. If you haven't read the paper that presents the test strategy model yet, stop the tape and download it. Skim it now. The other thing you should do now is download XMind and start creating a map like the one I'm showing you here. You'll need a heuristic test strategy map to do the assignment. This slide lists the product elements, like the product structures and functions. Here are the operational quality criteria. These are the qualities that end users notice, like reliability and security. And here are the quality criteria for development. These are things that the programmers notice about the internal design and implementation like maintainability and testability. This slide shows part of the test strategy model's project environment page. All of the categories, project environment, product elements, and quality criteria have subcategories and sub-subcategories. Here you can see two of the subcategories of project environment, customers and information. You can also see sub-subcategories. For example, who your customers are is a subcategory of customers. How well you communicate with your customers is a different subcategory. This slide shows part of my own map for the test strategy model. I've added all the subcategories to project environment and all the sub-subcategories. The little plus sign beside the subcategories means there's another level of detail for this map. If you click on a plus, the program will expand the displayed map to show those subcategories. So here I clicked on the plus sign beside customers of the test project and you can see all the subcategories of customers. You can add as many levels and as much detail as you want. This gives plenty of space and structure to fill in the details from the spec. You might have noticed that my map differs a little from James Bach's model. The original model considers only one type of customer. I show his list in the blue box. But I prefer to divide the customer group into two groups of stakeholders. The stakeholders of the overall project and the stakeholders of the testing subproject. Most of the time, these are the same people, same interests, same expectations. But sometimes the groups differ, and their interests and expectations are not the same. If there's a divergence, it's important for the test group to be aware of it and to manage it very carefully. It's very common for people who use this model to customize it, to adapt it to their specific needs. For your assignment, you'll probably stick with the original model. It's a good idea to work with the original for a while before changing it, but that's up to you. In product elements, I add another subcategory that I call benefits. I find it useful to consider explicitly why people would want to use the product. What do they want to accomplish with it? Those are its benefits. 
I think anything that interferes with a benefit that people reasonably expect from a product is a significant quality issue. Michael Bolton added another subcategory to product elements that he calls time. He finds it useful to lump everything that has to do with time into one analysis group. Some people customize quality criteria from project to project. For example, entertainment value is important for games, but not so important for databases. I don't usually customize project to project. Instead, my version of the model includes many criteria beyond the original, so more things already fit. So how do I use this model? Well, I have the spec in front of me, and as I read it, I notice it's saying something about the product, the project, or the quality criteria. So for example, suppose the spec says that some task has to be completed within one second. That's a performance requirement. So I note that on my concept map is relevant to the performance quality. I can make that note either as a comment on performance or as a new subcategory of performance. I can also make a note on the task, the specific feature that's supposed to work this quickly. That's in the product elements group. You'll see more of how this works when you do the assignment. Next we look at the spec's finer detail. What do the individual words mean? Cecile Spector's book, Saying One Thing Meaning Another, is the best collection I've seen of exercises and examples of ambiguity in the English language. And Richard Bender trains testers to look for ambiguity in his course on requirements-based testing. If you want to polish your skills at finding ambiguity in specs, Spector's and Bender's materials are really excellent. Finally, we get to the question, how do you create tests once you understand the specification? But it's not a simple answer. It depends on the kind of information you're looking for. What kinds of risks are you actually trying to manage? I think many people design spec-based tests at the very simplest level. They create one test per specification statement, and usually that's a test that's not very hard for the program to pass. I don't know what the point is of that. It's more of a demonstration that the spec's not wrong this time than it is anything you'd want to have confidence in. To achieve any real confidence in the spec, you have to go further than this. You have to ask harder questions. For example, what happens if you test with boundary conditions? What happens if you have tasks that approximate real-life complexity? How people have really used the product? Will the spec statement still be true under those circumstances? A traceability matrix is a common tool for tracking spec-based tests. You can use a traceability matrix to map tests to anything, so this chart's more general than a spec-based test chart. Using the chart's notation, each item would be a different specification statement. So test 1 tests specification statements 1, 2, and 3. Spec statement 5 is tested only by test 5. At the bottom of the chart, you can see how many tests are run against each item. The traceability matrix doesn't address the depth of testing of these items at all. It only says you've touched the item a certain number of times. Well, that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you take away a few lessons from this. First, the toughest part of real-life spec-based testing is probably figuring out what the spec is and what it says. Second, be sure to consider implicit specs, not just the explicit ones. Third, use active reading techniques or you'll drown in the details. Fourth, you need to understand the spec's context. It's too easy to waste time running tests against a document that no one cares about. And finally, it's rarely of much value to design one easy-to-pass test for each spec item. You can test the spec at many different levels of harshness and of sophistication. The most trivial level is rarely good enough.